from other humans were not important to you at all. So, in a sense, um, sorry, Freddie Mercury, but uh, fame and fortune, everything that goes with it, would not be acceptable to Diogenes. And there are um, a few things interesting about Diogenes for our talk, and the first thing about was, of course, his contempt for authority, which is a very important theme throughout this talk. And um, so much so that once Alexander the Great came up to him and he said, Diogenes, you're a great philosopher. Please let me know if there's anything at all I can do for you, and I'll make sure that it happens. To which he retorted, well, you can get out of the sun. You're blocking my light. Um, but even uh, uh, perhaps more important story about Diogenes is that he was the son of a coin minter. And he had contempt for fiat currency, so he went along and he debased that currency by destroying some of the coins, which got him banished to Athens. And so we go um, about a couple of millennia forward, and we go from Diogenes, who lived in a clay pot, to the whiskey barrel, and from Diogenes to the speakeasies. And the speakeasies, um, just to give you a little bit of, of background of what the speakeasies were, so this was taking top point in, in the roaring 20s. That was right between the time of after World War I and before the Great Depression, and boy, were people having fun. I mean, partying probably has never been experienced as the, in the world as much as it was in, in the roaring 20s, and just at that point of time, people were having crazy parties with, with sex, drugs, and music all the time, they decided maybe it's a good idea to have a prohibition on all alcohol. So the US, uh, on a federal level, made alcohol absolutely illegal, and in turn, of course, everybody stopped drinking alcohol and there was no partying. <laughs> well, actually, no, that's not what happened. What happened was that in New York City alone, there were over 300,000 of these underground bars and partying only got crazier. And the theme music for these parties was jazz. And jazz was a new form of fast-paced music that was coming up, very different from the music that white people were accustomed to listen to. And, um, and what was special about this is that the, um, the speakeasies was really the first time where this music got popular in pubs, because everything was illegal anyway, and everything was outlawed, so may as well have some fun. And it broke down a lot of these initial racial barriers, where in the first place, you know, even listening to black people play music was considered controversial, and here they are playing in these speakeasies, and in fact, you had blacks and whites hanging out of these speakeasies together. So, um, what's interesting about this situation is that um, you have the government outlawing alcohol, it brings everything underground, and all of a sudden everybody gets along together. <laughs> Um, and so this is what a lot of people who didn't approve of that, of course, had to say about jazz music. It is not music at all. It's merely an irritation of the nerves of hearing, a sensual teasing of the strings of physical passion. So first of all, that second part sounds pretty awesome to me. And then the next one is even better. Jazz was originally the accompaniment of the voodoo dance, stimulating half-crazed barbarians to the vilest of deeds. It's so like, yeah, of course I want to listen to that. Um, and that's basically, that's what the, the, I guess, the old guard was really concerned about, is that, you know, all these people listening to voodoo music. Um, and so, uh, well, from the jazz, it all starts, but all of a sudden something very interesting happened. It was a brand new technology, which was radio. And so radio started in the 20s. Um, and actually, it was uh, it preceded another very important technology, which I'll go over very quickly, which was the phonograph. Now, it may sound kind of trivial, but the phonograph was the first time that music was ever recorded. So before you had phonographs, it wasn't you couldn't just listen to music at home, right? You either went and saw a band live, and that was it. It was lost forever. And phonographs were the beginning of, of, of a period where people could actually buy a record and play it at home that somebody had recorded. So it was the very beginning of recorded music, and, and if you want to take parallels, uh, phonograph is kind of like the, the invention of the PC computer, and radio is like the invention of the internet. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden with radio music, all you needed was, um, was uh, a radio receiver, and you could all of a sudden listen to uh, not only one record, but anything that was going on there. And so that was pretty, that was obviously um, 
it was it was a revolutionary technology, and it also started bringing all kinds of different music into people's homes for the first time. Like maybe they weren't accustomed to listen to it, or maybe they wouldn't go out and buy a jazz album. But then if it's on the radio, it's kind of nice, actually, you know, when nobody else is around. Um, and then, of course, what did that lead to? It led to, well, the FCC is like, hmm, well, we better regulate this. You know, we don't want people having too much fun. And, and so what they said is, of course, it's for safety reasons. If everybody just, you know, uses this radio thing, it'll, it'll cause all kinds of problems. And, and you have to be able to have one channel um, that's licensed by us, and then everything will work out. And, um, you know, what could go wrong? Um, and of course what that led to is, uh, well, we'll see this in a bit, I don't want to ruin everything, but what it led to is that the, basically censorship, right? The, the, the FCC got to decide what to put on the radio and what not to put on the radio, and what was fit for listening to radio, and that's where the whole thing, so, you know, you're not allowed to say swear words, um, came around, but it's also music, they felt music was too controversial, they didn't, they could have outlawed that as well, and as part of, you know, well, we need to make sure that this is properly licensed. Um, and then we get to rock and roll. So I don't know if any of you guys uh, are familiar with this woman. This woman's name is Sister Rosetta Tharp, and she's about as controversial at the time as you could possibly imagine. She was an electric guitar playing, bisexual, black woman from the South. And pretty much anyone that listened to her music got offended, right? Because the, the church didn't like her because she was too sexual. You know, woman playing this electric guitar. Um, and obviously she was black and a woman and people just didn't know what to do with it. But she got hugely famous because she was really amazing. And she had this just ridiculously um, addictive voice. And she played the guitar like nobody had ever experienced it before. And in fact, she is the mother of rock and roll. So without this woman right here, we would have, Chuck Berry would have never gotten into electric guitar the same way. And Elvis Presley never would have been Elvis Presley. And we would have, probably wouldn't have had rock and roll in its chicken form we have now. So she invented it, even though pretty much everything she was doing was controversial, including going on tour with her female lover, uh, which she wouldn't admit, but everybody knew it was, it was pretty obvious. Um, but rock and roll was also very interesting because it was the first time that teenagers were listening to music that was um, created by black people. And it seems like pretty normal now with all the rap music going out, but this was something that a lot of parents weren't cool with, but they're teenagers. So of course they're like, well, screw you, I'm going to listen to this because you made it. And um, so it made much another thing that broke down a lot of barriers because it's all of a sudden, you know, you have well, everybody loves rock and roll, right? It isn't like, well, whites listen to this music and blacks are still listening to that music. Everybody loves rock and roll. Back to the radio, and there's a scandal in the 50s. And maybe you could have seen this coming, but what happens when the FCC decides that only you know, specific channels get a license? Well, this was called payola, and this happened in the 1950s. And it got to the point where radio disc jockeys decided what's trendy and what's not. What are they going to play and what not? So what ended up happening is that the big record companies would kind of slip them a few bills and be like, well, this is what's trendy, guys. You should play, you know, these guys just put out a bill, all of them, they're, they're the next big thing, here's some money, right? And they were doing this for a while, well, the whole time, ever since, um, you know, you had these large record companies and you had a limited amount of, of radio channels. Um, and then the audience was, was half like, they didn't know what was going on. They were like, well, there are these D radio DJs which are the biggest thing right now. Everybody's listening to these DJs and trusting them to know what's the next, what, what the next trendy thing is. So they were happy to go along with it. They didn't realize anything was wrong. But then when it finally came out, it was a big scandal and there were court cases and, and, um, and they got some disc jockeys into trouble. Of course, um, it never really ended. The, just something that happens. And now it's a little bit less of an issue because you have a lot more radio channels and you have the internet and Spotify and stuff, but it's still going on. Um, and now things start getting a little bit fun. We're talking about early punk. And um, the interesting thing about punk is obviously they didn't invent rock and roll, they didn't invent um, jazz, but what they did do is they kind of started moving it in a different direction. 
So once rock and roll got mainstream, it got a little boring, and we know this is what always happens with music, like things are controversial, and then they're normal, and then they're boring, and then okay, we need something to be a little bit edgier. And that's what started happening in the 60s with proto-punk bands such as MC5, Iggy Pop, Sonics, some of you may be familiar with them, but they just, they just took it up a notch. And part of that is technology, amps got bigger, and louder, and more powerful. Um, Sex Pistols you're all aware of, but uh, I'm not going to go too much into them. They were very provocative, but in a lot of ways mostly about the, the fashion and the approach, um, and their music as well. Um, Ramones, one of my favorites, they just said, well, you know what, we're bored with everything that's going on in the 70s, 70s now, there's some like funk coming in, huge stadium rock, um, which isn't accessible to a lot of people, let's turn it up a notch. Um, and actually when asked in an interview, well, why do you guys play so loud? And they're just like, oh, because we have amps and they go higher. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, well, we can. We have the technology to do this now, kind of answer. Um, and then uh, the show started because of all the, like, the raw energy and, and young people going to these, uh, to, these, to these shows, they started getting a little rowdy and um, at sometimes a, a little violent. And of course, early punks, you know, lost a little bit of its edge at one point. And like, well, can we, can, is there anything more we can do to this punk to make it edgier? And that's where we get to hardcore punk. And it started in the late 70s with bands such as the Dead Kennedys, the Bad Brains, Minor Threat, the Descendants, Black Flag, Black Flag, Circle Jerks. Um, if you have, if you can take a photo of this one and just like put them into your Spotify, and you'll have a lot of fun. Um, and basically, hardcore punk is just louder and it's faster and it's, and it's more aggressive. Um, but something else interesting happens, um, and that's that they start becoming critical um, and more philosophical. So this almost like brings us back to some of the things that Agenes was concerned about, like, well, you know, how do we how do we keep our integrity? And this is something that the earlier punks weren't so concerned about, and rock and roll definitely wasn't concerned about integrity. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that you get edgier, edgier, and edgier, and then all of a sudden you kind of get geeky with this stuff and start thinking, well, you know, do we still have our integrity? What are we doing here? Why are we playing this music? And um, and that's one of the, it, it actually is a cultural change that is very important. And just to give a little bit of background of why this is happening, is that you have, again, you have all the stadium rock, right? And you have um, huge bands, Rolling Stones, Beatles, um, Jefferson Airplane, that are filling, filling you know, stadiums, and, but it's not always accessible to everyone. And if you want to you know, be in a band, it's not gonna, you know, you're not gonna be as big as these guys. They're only around like you know, 10 of them in the world. But at the same time, guitars started getting cheaper. Electric guitars, you could go to a Sears in the US and buy one for 50 bucks, which is, you know, about, I guess, 400, 500 dollars today, instead of 3,000, which you would have had to pay. So who has money to go out as a teenager and buy a 3,000 dollar guitar? No one. But 400, 500, you could work a bit and get that guitar. And so what happened, started happening, is that all of a sudden, playing music became more affordable. So everybody could go out and start playing in their garage, and you don't have to be a rock star that studied guitar your whole life and dedicated to it. You could just grab an electric guitar, some other guy grabs a set of drums, some other guy, you know, and it doesn't matter how good or bad you are, you just start playing. And so the ante is towards those, those huge rock and roll bands, um, and, and how do we stay away and keep true to ourselves and really do this for ourselves, and not because we want to be super famous, um, and, and uh, I guess the way Diogenes would put it, you know, with uh, a lack of virtue. Um, so there's actually a hardcore ethos that started developing. And the first one of it was, was DIY, which in other words, what we know from the, uh, the crypto, uh, crypto realm these days is permissionless, right? We don't need permission to start a bank. We can just go and do it. We don't need anybody's help. We have the tools. We have these electric guitars. We have these massive amps. Let's just plug it in and make noise. And then uh, the other one is it's all about independent thought. We're not doing this for anyone else, so we have to do it for ourselves. Anti-establishment, of course. I mean, if you're thinking for yourself, you're almost automatically anti-establishment because you don't want somebody else telling you what you should be thinking and how, how you should be acting. Uh, and they're also against the music industry, which they felt basically, um, if you sign with a, a major label and if you start being part of the, 
record industry, well, you're going to lose your art. You're going to lose what, you know, the part of you that's making this music because you created the song. And they were like, well, guys, what's trendy now is your last album. Just make an exact copy that everyone will be happy. And they're just like, no, we're going to play what we want, and we don't need you because it's not all of a sudden the barriers of entry for opening for starting a band are a lot lower. So we don't have to listen to you. We don't care about being a stadium band. We're just going to stay true to ourselves. And that's where the distaste for um, for selling out was called to major labels, of signing with a major label after you become a little popular, because selling out means that you, you've lost your integrity and you're only doing it for the money. And then if you want to be considered hardcore, that's not something you can do because then you're a poser. You just, you know, told everyone that you were hardcore to be popular. Uh, signaling, but without actually taking the work and, you know, sticking with it to the end. And then something else interesting happened that in the early days of hardcore punk, shows would get pretty violent, and especially with um, one specific band was called Black Flag, they were one of the most famous hardcore punk bands, and uh, their shows had started getting pretty violent, and they were okay with it for a while. But then all of a sudden, it was like, hey, you know, what is this all about? Why are we okay with it? And they actually were, they switched around. They became critical towards, towards their own community, in a sense, and said, hey, guys, you have to stop being aggressive, you have to stop beating these people up, it's not cool, it's not what we represent. And that started being a really strong theme afterwards throughout the, um, the hardcore is actually non-aggression. And I'll give you a, a cute example of that later on. Um, so let's go through a few of the quotes of, of some of the most famous hardcore punk bands so you can kind of get an idea of what, of what they were talking about in the day. So this is a famous one from Dead Kennedys with the song Nazi Punks Fuck Off. <laughs> and it goes, punk ain't no religious cult, punk means thinking for yourself. You ain't hardcore because you spike your hair. When a jock still lives, when a jock still lives inside your head, so uh, you know jocks are the guys causing violence. Who you know, like uh, uh, like football players that are coming in and just what they really enjoy about going to these shows beating people up. And they're like, you know, screw you. We don't need any of you Nazi punks coming to our show. We want people that can actually think for themselves. And then uh, another band by the name of Minor Threat had a song uh, called Out of Step which is, I don't smoke, don't drink, don't fuck, at least I can fucking think. Now, the funny thing is that he's saying this is, this is about individuality. It's like, you guys do whatever you want. I don't enjoy smoking weed or drinking all of the time or just having promiscuous, you know, just going after promiscuous, uh, promiscuous sex. Um, but I do like the sitting down and thinking and writing about it. You guys do whatever you want, just don't tell me that this is what I have to do to be hardcore or cool or punk. And the ironic thing about this is that this song basically created um, a group called Straight Edge, or a culture called Straight Edge, and they believed that you can't smoke, and you can't drink, and you can't do all these things, and they just kind of turned into that whole group thing just based on this song, which is, at least in my opinion, pretty ironic. Um, and here we go back to Black Flag, and they say, we are tired of your abuse, try to stop us, it's no use. Society, arms of control, rise above, we're going to rise above, think they're smart, can't think for themselves. So you can see it's a recurring um, theme in all of these, these, these popular hardcore punk bands from this era. It's all about, you have to start thinking for yourself, um, don't do things just because people tell you to, don't listen to um, authority, we're all against this, we have the tools to think for ourselves and do things on our own, um, and that's the most important thing for us. And, um, and this is actually a very interesting thing culturally, and it's, for me it's exciting to see how this kind of turned into something entirely different, which we'll talk about in just a second. After this, um, one example of non-aggression um, from a punk band called Fugazi um, in, this was probably the early 90s, um, and uh, they're in the middle of a show, and uh, those are the little ice creams. Um, they're in this middle of the show, and all of a sudden, somebody kicks somebody else. And, and the lead guitarist, Guy Pichetto, saw that, and he stops the show. And he's like, hey, I saw you guys earlier at the Good Humor truck. And you were eating your ice cream like little boys, and I thought, those guys aren't so tough. What's old guys? They're eating ice cream. I saw you eating an ice cream cone, pal. Oh, you're bad now. But I saw you, that's the shit you can't hide. You eat ice cream, everybody knows it, ice cream eating motherfucker, that's what you are. 
So he shamed him in front of everyone because he kicked somebody, you know, in the face or something in the middle of the show that was very important for them that everybody has a good time. Uh, and he put him in his place, and that's kind of, uh, that became pretty famous, and, and it was copied by, by other bands afterwards. Um, but it was just kind of like this, this perfect moment that really defines what hardcore punk was about. Um, and so from this, we go in, a, in a kind of an entirely different direction um, from hardcore punk rock to the very, very beginning of cypherpunk. And cypherpunk had nothing to do with music. Um, this was about cryptography. And David Chow was kind of the sister Rosetta Tharp of, of cryptography in the sense that he was talking about these things before anybody was even thinking. This is 1985. Personal computers were barely out. And this guy's talking about some things that are super relevant even to our day. So now reading this, it just seems like a boring article. You know, security without identification, transactions, like, you know, why, what conference are we at now? Um, but it's actually was very provocative at the time. Uh, for those who read it, which probably wasn't, weren't too many. And um, so what he's writing about is transaction systems to make Big Brother obsolete. Some of our basic liberties may be threatened by computerization. The interlinking of relationships and the surveillance required just for practical security may become unacceptable. So like he's seeing things that, that we still don't always recognize today. And I mean, the fact for it is like, look at what we're using. We're using Facebook that has all of our information. Um, you know, Amazon, Apple, Instagram, everything we use is, is collecting all of our information and everything about our identities out there. And they've, they've all been hacked. All the credit cards that we use, they've all been hacked. Um, but it felt like nobody was thinking about it, just that nobody listened and nobody cared enough. So such surveillance and linking are unnecessary when information can be made public, scanned, or bought and sold pseudonymously. Um, a few years later, Tim May writes the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And man, you know, I wish I was there. Um, this is 20 years before Bitcoin, right? So this is, again, nobody is looking in this direction. Uh, crypto anarchy isn't something that people just were talking about, like, hey, are you a crypto anarchist now? You know, more like an anarcho capitalist. Um, a specter is haunting the modern world, the specter of crypto anarchy. This gets pretty hardcore. Interactions over networks will be untraceable by extensive rerouting of encrypted packets. By the way, uh, who here is familiar with the idea of, of cryptography? Just as a general idea. So, okay. Just a very, very quick primer. Cryptography is basically the art of keeping secrets. And when I talk about cryptography now, it's mostly digital cryptography, but cryptography has been around forever, ever since people had secrets. So the idea with cryptography is how do I write something, encrypt it, so that nobody can then read it without, say, the password, and then send it to someone else who can then read it on their side. And then there's a whole science behind it, and uh, we would not have uh, anything safe on the internet without cryptography, and we also would not have things such as cryptocurrencies, which are cryptographic currencies. Um, so he writes, these developments will alter completely the nature of government regulation. Yes, please. The ability to tax and control economic interactions, keep going. The ability to keep information secret and will even alter the nature of trust and reputation. So he's talking about these things again way before anybody else is. And this was in 1988, and uh, uh, a few years later, it started getting a little bit more popular. And uh, we're going to another very, very cool woman here, which is St. Jude, which is was hardly ever talked about. And, uh, you know, I've been interested in, in, in cypherpunk and, crypt and you know, cryptocurrencies for a while. I only found out about her a few weeks ago. Um, but she is actually the tie from the hardcore punk world into the cypherpunk and cryptography world. And she started getting into hacking in the late 60s. So she's probably the first girl hacker, or at least notable one. And the modem girl you see with all those R's is actually influenced by a very influential um, all-female hardcore band from the time called Bikini Kill. <laughs> and Bikini Kill had a, had a song called um, Rebel Girl. And, um, and they kind of were the beginning of this girl power brand of punk. 
which was all about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a version of feminism. It's, we have the power to do everything, we don't have to listen to you, we'll do whatever we want to. And so she was into that as well as hacking, and so you can kind of see how it brought uh, the worlds together, and in fact, she was the one who coined the term cypherpunks. And we'll get into that next slide. But what she says about hacking is, hacking is the clever circumvention of imposed limits, whether imposed by your government, your IP server, your own personality, or the laws of physics. Um, and so for her, obviously, hacking was a very big deal, getting around anything that stopped her. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty empowering idea. Um, and it's, it's very, I think we're all kind of fortunate that she was into these both worlds, taking a lot from that hardcore punk ethos and just, and just being at the right point at the right time where you had people starting to talk about cryptography and crypto anarchy and, and putting all these things together. And so in 1992, the cypherpunk movement officially started as a mailing list. It was just a, a Google, well, not Google, of course, uh, but it was a mailing list um, that people just, anybody could get onto. It was called the, the, the cypherpunk mailing list. And people started sharing ideas. And we're going to go through a bit of those ideas right now, because you'll see where they lead to. I mean, you're probably already guessing, but uh, I don't want to ruin any surprises. Um, so, Cypherpunks Manifesto, 1992 by Eric Hughes, Cypherpunks Write Code. We know that someone has to write software to defend privacy, and since we can't get privacy unless we all do, we're going to write it. And this is, you know, permissionless, DIY, not waiting for anyone, just going ahead and doing it. Our code is free for all to use worldwide. We don't much care if you don't approve of the software we write. We know that software can't be destroyed, and that a widely dispersed system can't be shut down. Um, and uh, a lot of people were empowered by that and, um, and started writing code. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people realized that point, that you know, we don't have to wait for someone else to do it, we have the tool. And in the same way that uh, hardcore punks could just go to Sears and buy guitars um, and get things for cheap, well, you have a computer, you can just write code. You don't have to wait for anything. The barriers of entry of writing cryptography have already gone way down. Um, and now, in between the cypherpunks beginning and Bitcoin, uh, was a very important paper written by Wei Dai in 1998, 10 years before Bitcoin. And, oh, damn it, ruined everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so he has this idea of bean money. What is bean money? And he writes, it's, it's a lot more crypto energy, yes. Unlike the community is traditionally associated with the word anarchy, in a crypto anarchy, the government is not temporarily destroyed, but permanently forbidden and permanently unnecessary. It's a community where the threat of violence is impotent because violence is impossible. And violence is impossible because its participants cannot be linked to their true names or physical locations. This is total cyberpunk and cyberpunk, you know, it's, it's hard to say how much this is, is applicable, um, but I like, uh, you know, I like where he's going with this. Uh, but he wrote this, this Be Money paper, which actually drew out an idea of a decentralized cryptocurrency. And it didn't have everything figured out, but uh, without this paper, we would not have cryptocurrencies. Or at least it would take a little bit longer. Um, and so what's the cypherpunk ethos? This is of the 90s. So first of all, like the hardcore punk, cypherpunks write code. It's about privacy, making sure everything you do online, that you decide who to give it to and who not, and not just have it deposited in some huge database where governments and corporations can do with it as they choose. Cybersecurity, making sure that everything is secure and people can't just hack into your own computer. Transparency, making everything open source. And this is another integrity coming into play again, and that's a, a, a big part of it. And it's open for everyone to share and do it all together. It's like a real open community. And the interesting thing about open source is that I haven't seen it in a lot of other fields. It's kind of something that it stayed in coding and didn't move a lot past that. Like you don't have a lot of open source in graphic design uh, or even in music. You know, it's not like, well, hey guys, I wrote this thing that everybody could add to it, uh, which probably would have been pretty cool, but it didn't happen. They're against intellectual property, uh, which is why we have things like BitTorrent. 
Uh, but the idea is that, yeah, intellectual property is in this. Well, we can get into this another. It's an entirely different talk of whether libertarians think intellectual property is or isn't property, but I would argue that it's not property. Um, but the, the main point is that uh, they were fighting it. Um, and then we go to the cyber wars of the 90s, and this was Clinton-era US, and they were really concerned about cryptography evolving on a private level. It's like, wait, this is something that only governments are supposed to have. What are we going to do if we don't, if these people are, you know, have secrets and we can't see them? And so basically they decided that, okay, let's just say that uh, cryptography is, is like munitions, it's like a weapon, so you can't export it, and then everything will be cool. Um, but I guess not everybody got the memo, and this is uh, Phil Zimmerman who did something pretty cool, and he worked on a project called Pretty Good Privacy, or PGP, and the idea of it, well, he just released it to code for everyone to use, and the idea of PGP is um, it's public-private key cryptography, which means that um, I can write a message and sign it with my key, and if I send it to your public key, then you can open it with your private key. And it's a pretty simple idea, and it's been used ever since. It's not the most user-friendly, but it's reliable. And so he just released this to the world. Um, I guess probably was not even realizing how legal it was, and that he's just he's going to be accused of being an international um, uh, weapons dealer. But that's kind of what happened. The government was not very happy about it. Um, because they had a restriction that the encryption for export could, could only be under 40 bits, which is like nothing. Anybody could track that, um, even at the time. Now you could probably track it you know, on your Apple Watch. Um, and they said it's illegal for export, and yet this guy just released it openly to the internet. Um, so he was investigated as a munitions dealer, and I'm sure he, you know, it's terrifying. All of a sudden, the U.S. government's after you um, as an international weapons dealer when all you did was sat on your computer and wrote some code, but he fought them. And one of the brilliant things he did was he printed out his code uh, and published it as a book. And in the U.S., if you do that, you're protected by freedom of speech. <laughs> yes. So he just printed it, and he shipped these books to Amsterdam, and in Amsterdam they, they had scanning parties. They just go and they scan um, um, all of the code from these books, and then it's like, well, I did it this way, what are you guys going to do now? And basically, it worked. <laughs> they kind of, you know, they didn't know what to do about it, and, and eventually he didn't go up going to prison. You know, maybe they scared him a bit, but uh, PGP was available for everyone all around the world after that, the second he got outside of the U.S. Um, and then another example of what the cyber wars, what they were trying to do, was uh, something called the clipper chip. And this was, uh, again, the Clinton era, and they had this great idea of like, okay, well, you're going to use cryptography, but we'll make all the telecom manufacturers use one that we approve, that we have a back door to. So if we really have to get something off of this, we will, but it'll be secure for everyone else. And they put tons and tons of money and resources into this, and made this whole big deal, and made sure they signed up all the telecom communication manufacturers of modems and, and telephones and whatnot. Um, and then in like a few months, uh, Cypherpunk by the name of Matt Blaze, Blaze, he destroyed it completely. He broke it and they just gave up. It's like, okay, we don't know what to do. So the crypto wars kind of ended at that point and they relaxed their restrictions in 96. You know, there's still a little bit of back and forth of what the government is comfortable with and not in different countries. But that was a huge part of how a very small group of people were able to defeat by technology um, the U.S. government. And that kind of shows the power that you can have um, if you just use the right tools. You don't have to be a huge organization. You can do it on, on your own. Um, okay, we're running out a bit of time. So I'll just go there's a few, click it faster, notable projects from the cyberpunks. Um, PGP, as I mentioned, Tor onion routing is a way to um, it's a way to get to the dark web. Basically, BitTorrent, which I hope all of you use, it's a great way of downloading TV shows when Netflix isn't working. Um, Signal is a great way to communicate when you don't want other people reading it. Um, and just to guess, we're starting to get to cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency, the first ideas, David Chow, you remember him? 
Um, he worked on a project called Digicash in 89, <laughs> Adam Back, Hashcash in 97, and Wave Dye and B Money in 1998. And these were kind of like the precursors to Bitcoin. But at the same time, we also had um, some guys that were working on some private currencies that weren't decentralized at all. They were very centralized, but it was the same idea of, well, we have the internet now. We want payments to be successful and easy on the internet. We'll just have um, companies that create um, tokens based on, say, gold, for example, right? And so it seems pretty innocent, you know, it's just this is a currency based on gold, and we're going to help you pay for things online no matter where you are in the world. So there was e-gold, another example was a Liberty Dollar, and Liberty Reserve, and they were all shut down by the U.S. government. Just a matter of how much time, some of them went to prison or are going to prison, some barely got out of it, but it did not end pretty at all. And these guys weren't necessarily breaking any laws, they just were centralized and they did stuff the U.S. government didn't like. And, you know, when the U.S. government comes at you with, um, with their guns, there's not much you can really do at that point. Um, and so, no, this is what one of the attorneys in the Western District said about the uh, Liberty Dollar. It's a unique form of domestic terrorism that is trying to undermine the legitimate currency of this country. It's like, well, first of all, it's that easy to undermine the legitimate currency of this country, then maybe it's a problem with fiat to begin with. But um, the other thing is that just calling it domestic terrorism, if someone just had a startup idea of, hey, maybe if we, you know, have these tokens be based on gold and let people pay with it is absolutely ridiculous. But it also shows that you can't just have a, a centralized currency in the world and say, okay, you know, maybe this will work. We'll offer an alternative, um, a free market alternative. Um, and that's where Bitcoin comes along. In 2009, um, white paper released in, in late 2008 with the working cl uh, client in 2009. And, well, honestly, at first, nobody really cared. Nobody knew what it was, nobody thought it would work. Um, and it was only really when, when it started getting some price traction around 2011 that people started paying attention. It's like, wow, it actually has value. How does this work? And looking into it. Um, and libertarians, of course, were the first to embrace. Um, I was in New Hampshire at the time, in front of the Free State Project. And, um, and everybody was talking about it and getting excited about it and using it as much as possible just to play around with it. Um, I think I may have bought... Um, honey for one Bitcoin at the time, which, I mean, it was good, but not that good. Um, big mistake. And, uh, and that's like, Josh and I at that point, we started, uh, we started going actually with a bunch of SFL local conferences in, uh, around, you know, in the US, around the Boston, and New York, and Philadelphia, just giving out leaflets, like, gosh, Bitcoin's awesome. You should, you should learn about it, and eventually to, uh, to Washington as well. Um, but uh, eventually, what, you know, the, the, there were two main things that really caused a bit more mainstream adoption. I don't know how mainstream, but more adoption. And one was that the price actually started, you know, going over like a dollar. And you're like, what's going on here? What is this thing? And of course, drugs. <laughs> and you know, it, it, that's part of uh, the dark web. And that's right, Russ Albright right there, who founded the Silk Road in 2011, which was a dark web. Marketplace basically an eBay where you could buy anything you wanted, and you could because now you have Bitcoin, and that was the <laughs> currency of the dark web. And it was going really well, and it was driving up the price of Bitcoin, and everybody was talking about it. Um, unfortunately, it was shut down. They found out who he was. He made some mistakes. Some of the people, he wasn't good enough at cryptography, unfortunately. And he was actually tried, and now he's sentenced to a life in prison without parole, which is something not even reserved for most rapists and murderers. Um, so it's, it's very sad. Um, he was probably about 25 or so at the time. Um, it's just a cool idea he thought would, you know, enable people to to buy drugs peacefully. Um, just. Going through the Bitcoin fundamentals, because how much time do we have? Not a lot, right? Oh, okay. I think. Uh, yeah, we're good. Okay, so some of the things that are absolutely unbelievable about Bitcoin, uh, and you know, some maybe some other cryptocurrencies, but specifically Bitcoin, it's digital and highly transferable, unlike gold, for example. It's scarce and requires considerable energy to create, so it, it's expensive to create them to begin with. Um, 
and that contributes to the security of the system as well. And it's limited supply, only 21 million bitcoins will ever be created. It's fungible, meaning one bitcoin equals one bitcoin all the time. Um, this is, well, it's mostly true. <laughs> we can talk about this later. It could be better. If you have better privacy, then you have better fungibility because um, eventually if you like buy bitcoins on an exchange and they're marked for AML KYC, then they can make them a little less fungible. But entirely different conversation. I don't want to get into it now. Um, it's immutable, meaning nobody can stop you from sending it. Nobody can censor a Bitcoin payment. Permissionless. Unowned, decentralized. And this is one of the most important things because we saw with all the private currencies, they were shut down and, and you know fairly quickly. And governments haven't been able to shut down Bitcoin because there's no ownership of Bitcoin. And divisible can buy a fraction. So again, that's what something, for example, gold doesn't have. Um, so why is decentralization so important? Well, we saw what happened with regular with radio regulation, it centralized the music. And we know that the internet centralized is all of the data. Central banks centralize money. Regulation in general centralizes a lot more of the markets. Like for instance, you may have heard that, that Facebook is asking for regulation. Why are they doing that? They want to keep competitors out. And so we really need distributed systems because they regulate the regulation. They regulate the bad laws. They give you an alternative when an alternative isn't being offered to you by the system that can be regulated. And so, um, <laughs> this is a great quote. <coughs> Sum things up. The European Central Bank Executive Board member said, Bitcoin is the evil spawn of the financial crisis. <laughs> So it's kind of how you know that you're doing something right in the right direction, <laughs> right? And so if we talk about crypto anarchy, well, you know, what is it? So we've got a little bit of uh, spice it up. We've got a little bit of hardcore punk DIY in there. We've got a little bit of libertarian economics. We have a little bit of cypherpunk codes. And we have the evil spawn, which is Bitcoin. Um, and, I mean, it's taken a while, you have to have the technology, you have to have the culture, you have to have the science behind this, and it's taken a while, but it's something that, um, I mean, obviously I'm excited about cryptocurrencies, but I think that every libertarian should stop and think for a second, like, how important is this Bitcoin thing, and, you know, how do I see myself as a libertarian if I'm not using this? Because this is one of the most powerful tools, if not the most powerful tool, that libertarians have ever had. And this is something that, um, if you know how to use it correctly, it can be very powerful. And eventually, if everybody's using Bitcoin, whether they're libertarian or socialist, it's going to take away from the power of governments because they won't just be able to, you know, print $250 trillion of debt like they're doing now. They just, if, if there's real money, even if they, you know, if they have to use cryptocurrencies because nobody's using their fiat, that will very much so change how much power governments have. And so bonus slide for today um, is one more point of, uh, of the DIY culture. And this is CSTEs, I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with, they've been talking about them for a while. How do we build you know, countries in the middle of the sea since all the land is already taken up by evil governments? And, um, and they've been talking about it probably for about 10 years or over. But just a few months ago, somebody who bought into Bitcoin early, I should say, just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and build one. I'm sick about reading all this. And so he started a company called Ocean Builders and took his uh, girlfriend and they just built this thing. And it's been up for, I think, what, like a couple of months now, maybe even less. And it's actually a, a very small two bedroom apartment in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, but she's happy. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and they want to build another 20 of these right now. So this is an example of someone, who, nobody's ever heard of them. You know, they, were, they don't have necessarily really special skills. They're just like, well, I want this to happen. I'm going to do it and make it happen without asking for permission. Keep the video. Um, and so that's it for today. Thank you very much.